As Oregon and the rest of the country work to transition to renewable energy, conflicts often arise about where to put things like wind turbines and solar panels. But a researcher from Oregon State University is on the leading edge of a new way to head off some of those conflicts. Combining farmland and solar panels. Taking the meaning of solar farm to a next level. And as he tells it, the idea might just be a game changer. Environmental reporter Cale Williams brings us our story. On a small research farm outside of Wilsonville, Chad Higgins feels like he's watching the future unfold. I see a path to, to a future where we're not under exigent threat of self-destruction. Higgins, a biological and environmental engineering professor at Oregon State University, oversees a five-acre experiment in agrivoltaics. For those who haven't heard the term, Higgins explains. It's the co-location of both solar energy harvesting and agricultural uh, production on the same piece of land for mutual benefit. And it's that mutual benefit that has Higgins so optimistic about the future. More plant productivity, better quality crops, more nutritious, less water use, more energy use. That's what you get when you put them together. It's a true synergy when you put them together. Higgins has been experimenting with agrivoltaics for nearly a decade. And one of the things he's learned is that many plants actually get more sun than they need. So the leaves, to stay cool, they pull water from the ground and, 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 and sweat, basically, evaporate. That cools them off. But that means crops use more water, and agriculture already accounts for more than 70% of global water use. You take away the amount of light that the plants are not going to use and can't physiologically use. That reduces their stress. They use less water. You get more productivity because you have less stress plant. So more crop, higher quality crop, crop less water. Now, you could block that extra light with a shade, or you could do it with solar panels, harvesting the extra sunlight for something humans are in desperate need of, clean electricity. Once you do, you've got yourself a happy plant. So a happy plant is a, is a more producing plant. It's a less water using plant. It's a higher quality crop plant. Using solar panels to regulate how much sun each field gets has shown promising results. Higgins has grown tomatoes with bigger yields and beans with higher protein content. He's raised sheep in fields under solar panels, and while the sheep didn't grow any faster, he was able to graze more of them per acre because the grass grew more quickly. He's also found that because plants cool the environment around them, the solar panels work more efficiently. But all of that was on small-scale projects. The project he's working on now at the North Willamette Research and Extension Center is the first time he's put his theories to the test at a scale resembling an actual working farm. Where we showed that the plane could fly, but we have to figure out how to develop a commercial jetliner now. Higgins sees the development of agrivoltaics as the kind of thing that could provide a necessary paradigm shift in both farming and energy production. Experts put the maximum capacity of the globe at somewhere between 10 and 12 billion people. And projections have us reaching that threshold before the end of the century. The limiting factor? Having enough food and water to feed everyone. If you assume current course and we don't really come up with any new technologies or paradigm shifts, then yeah, the projections look kind of gloomy. And by gloomy, Higgins is referring to widespread food shortages and conflicts over a scarce water supply. But because agrivoltaics increase production, cut water use, and provide renewable power, Higgins isn't fearful for the future. If you include dual-use agrivoltaics as a methodology in your projections, um, you actually come up with a future that's sustainable. Now, of course, the practice isn't all upside. It won't work everywhere or with every kind of crop. It might be hard to get insurers to cover expensive solar panels in fields where farm equipment is working. And the upfront costs are sizable. Though Higgins said his research shows that these kinds of projects pay for themselves within a decade or less. After that, they add to the bottom line for farmers. I don't have to convince people to have a different ethical uh, or a political viewpoint or, or anything. It's a, it's, a, it's a profitable enterprise to do it. Um, so so I'm, I'm more about changing pockets than I am about changing minds. And that's the biggest reason why Higgins sees agrivoltaics expanding rapidly in the coming years. It's a moneymaker. From science to full-scale implementation is going to be five years. That's pretty fast. Um, and, and the reason for that is because it's just, it's profit positive. Well, I've been able to corral Kale here in the newsroom to ask a little bit more about this story. Let's talk about those panels. Do they move? 
Indeed they do. They are on pistons, and so they start facing east when the sun comes up, follow them all day as the sun sets on the other side, and, you know, they actually can go fully vertical, and that allows farm equipment and tractors to go up and down the rows. Okay, interesting. And he said 10 years to get their money back out of it. That seems like a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think that the economics of this are still to be determined. This is still an experiment, and once this gets out into the open market, that will really figure out how economically viable these are. But, I mean, it increases the productivity of the crops you're already growing. You're producing power that you can sell back to the grid. I mean, it's a dual benefit type of system. Yeah, it is interesting. It's fascinating, actually. Um, all right, and if there was wide-scale adoption of this, what do you think? So he told me that if 1% of American farmland were converted to these agrivoltaic systems, that that would meet all of our clean energy goals. And I think in his paper it said something like it would be the equivalent of removing about 71,000 cars from the road annually. Wow. Okay. Impressive and promising. We'll have to stay tuned and see how that goes. Thanks, Kale. It's great stuff. Sure thing.